here I'm uh, continuing with the Proto-Renaissance and uh, we'll look more in depth on uh, Giotto. This is an image of the Scrovenia Chapel. It's also called the Arena Chapel. Uh, it's in Padua, which is in North Italy. And the reason we're looking at it is because Giotto painted in it. And Giotto is from Florence, and most of the work that, we, that we're going to look at is by Florentine painters. Uh, that they sort of began this, this proto-Renaissance. And uh, uh, well, it was specifically Giotto did. And uh, he was called away in different parts of Italy to, to paint, and almost everything that he did is outside of Florence uh, that we still have. So in this chapel uh, is, is a, a lot of frescoes, and the whole thing was made so as to uh, house these frescoes. If you look at the outside, it's essentially a box. It's not a, it's not a significant building architecturally. It's just a, a box to hold paintings, and it's, uh, you know, it has windows on one side to let enough light in so you can see them. There's one door in the middle and a, uh, an altar on the other end. So inside you walk in and there's a, uh, beautiful colors, and it's all painted uh, in fresco. Um, uh, you should you should look at a video on fresco. I'll probably put a link to one on how how fresco is made. Um, but it's it's done on wet plaster, and so they they plaster the wall and put paint on just directly onto the wet plaster. And as it dries and hardens, uh, the paint is fit into the matrix. This is a very small place. Uh, you look here. This is what it looks like. Looking at the the, the wall that has the door, uh, on the other end is the altar. And here's a photo that sort of gives you a sense of the scale of the building. It's about the size of a, like a basketball court. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Scrovegni, uh, the patron of it. He was a, a, a man who made his money, a uh, rich guy. He made his money through usury, which is a sin. His father uh, also made his money that way. And uh, in Dante's Inferno, his father appears as one of the uh, damned souls in hell. And, and he's, as he's the exemplar of the usurer, and he's, he's being punished for his usury. Um, this man, Scrovegni, is the son, who, who, who's the patron here, he was, uh, uh, you know, he made his money that way too, and was afraid that he would go to hell just like his father. So he uh, made this uh, this uh, donation to the church and had this church built uh, in order for to for for his own atonement. He wanted to buy himself into heaven, or or at least out of hell, uh, and that was pretty much the way it was done. It was a, the the society was made up of 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 rich people and poor people and there were very few rich people but unlike in the middle ages where essentially there's the royals there's the church and then there's the vast number of peasants underneath uh, one of the driving forces of the of the of the renaissance uh, economically was the rise of a middle class that is people who could um, go from being at the bottom to the middle, at least, by their own efforts of, of, of work and uh, having a business, producing something. And, uh, you know, and people like this, who is essentially bankers, uh, would rise to the top and have enough money to, to fund something like this. Now, it's not the most expensive thing he could have done. I mean, if, as rich people go, he wasn't so rich that he could afford uh, a much more lavish thing like a a whole chapel in a church and fill it with lots of gold and really expensive stuff. Fresco is relatively inexpensive compared to other things you might buy, like marble sculpture would be more more expensive. This building has one or a few little marble sculptures here. One's by a, a by Pisano, who who did the baptistry doors uh, in in Florence, and we'll we'll look at those later. Uh, but apart from that, it's it's all fresco. Uh, the bottom tier, if you look on this picture, this bottom tier is all uh, faux marble. You know, marble would be real expensive, but it's painted to look like marble. Um, there's 
images, little niches and, and statuary that, that are painted in there as well. And these represent the virtues and the vices. Um, the rest, it is, this is the, the end wall here, is the, the Last Judgment. But all these pictures here, these panels that you see on the wall, are very much like uh, uh, the comics in a newspaper. They're just, they're, each one is, a, you, you read it left to right. Up here, there's a story of uh, Mary's parents, Anna and Joachim. And they go along the top row on both sides. And then the other rows, these two rows, are the life of Christ. And with the last judgment on the end. On this end, you have uh, an annunciation right here. This is Gabriel and Mary. And you have Christ in majesty at the top. Uh, you have uh, a continuation of the, the life of Christ here with, uh, I believe this is Judas. You can zoom in a little. This is Judas in the, the 30 pieces of silver, and this is uh, the visitation. Down here, you see, there's just two, two extra little imagery uh, of, a, of, of this, like the, the interior of a little room. You can see the, the, the ceiling of the room and some, uh, uh, some sort of fixture hanging in the middle of it. Um, when you think about how this was made, and the kind of thing that was that preceded it in terms of wall decoration there's a lot of innovations here that are the sort of things that we talk about as moving in the direction of the renaissance when you do get into the renaissance after 1400 they they have the invention of of perspective it's a, a linear perspective or one point perspective it's it's it is a way of rendering space or a reason of organizing a picture in such a way that everything is seen from a single point of view and since you know we're really familiar with photography and ph photographs are also uh, an image of something seen from one point of view from the from wherever the lens is we see of we see images that are made with one point perspective as as true to life as more natural as the way things look and uh, and we also have a, a you know all the images from the Renaissance on of, of things made with that with that system so it's a very familiar thing but when you go before that time before uh, the notion that a picture was seen from one point of view um, you get things where multiple points of view were seen. I mean, is there wasn't any reason not to show one side of one thing and another side of, of the same thing that you wouldn't see in reality is in, at the same time, but uh, in a picture, there's no reason not to. Um, this is a kind of an in-between stage where uh, if you look at the these two little rooms here, this one over here and this one over here, you see this one from the same point of view, that if you, the, from this photograph, the person standing taking this photograph, seeing this room, if this were actually a room back there, it would look like that. The, the shape of the wall, the, the, the amount of, of, of covering up that this part does for the back wall looks right from this angle, and the one on this side also looks right from this angle, as if it was intended to be viewed from this point of view, so that it looks right. When you look at other things, like let's look at a, a close-up of the Annunciation back there. This is divided, the picture divided into the two, the left and the right. Look at this, this Annunciation is Gabriel telling uh, Mary that she's going to have a baby. And uh, it's going across this archway. But look at these, these, these um, I don't know, terraces, things projecting from a building. Box-like shapes with corbels holding them up. Um, they're remarkable in that they look very 3D. The one thing is the linear pattern of them and the way they recede. The one on the left recedes over there that way and the one on the right recedes this way, just, you know, the way you would expect. And the lighting on them, you know, there's a light comes from one place and it, and it makes one facet lighter and makes another facet darker and under here it's darker. So it's conceived as a, an object in space. It's a, the theme that uh, I, I kept harping on on the, the other video. That, that this new look, this revolution, was making it look as if the picture were um, the kind of things that you would see in the real world, that is, real objects in space. Let's look at just a section of the wall. Some of the pictures um, have a remarkable thing that uh, 
um, have nothing to do with real objects in space is it's this. This is a, a lamentation down here. This is uh, the Noli Me Tangere, which is the Christ's resurrection saying, you know, touch me not to the Mary down here who's about to touch the hem of his garment. Um, this is the feast at Cana, and this is the resurrection of Lazarus. There's Lazarus, and this is a, a little mountain that goes in the background here. It sort of goes up into the upper right, and it seems to continue on to this mountain over here. Um, that has nothing to do with, with a, a spatial relationship. It is a it is a compositional thing. It also, the same mountain if you think of it as going up here and going down here, it makes sense as, as a continuation of, of a, a compositional thing that links these two together, the death and the resurrection, or the, the, the death here and this resurrection up here, which is you know, the resu resurrection of, of Lazarus. So these, these pictures have a thematic relationship. They also have a formal relationship. Formal meaning the forms of the picture, the lines, the shapes, the tones, all these things that you use to, uh, to make a picture are, uh, uh, are used for a purpose other than depicting, but as a way of composing. Another feature, uh, we see everything is done in these, these, these rectangular panels. Between the panels are these broad uh, bands of decoration. The decorations made up of, look up a little closer, are made up of, of geometric patterns and they're very elaborate, lots of little colors, little little details in a small space. And there's some extra pictures, like this is the creation of Adam here. Um, you know, other little stories that are within the, the uh, between each story, and then, and then some of them have some relationship between them and the and the story going on. Looking up here, there's some saints painted in these uh, quatrefoils up here. Um, so you see. When you look at these pictures, I mean, if you don't even know the story, you can see that this is as a kind of a cartoon version of of the Christian stories. There's, you know, there's people here. They are depicted as masses. You can see them as volumes. They have light coming from one side and 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 shadow on the other, so they look real volumetric, and they seem to stand as almost you know boulder like here. Like, these look like boulders. They're so massive, and the and any time there's an architectural space, it looks convincingly real, though in many cases it's, it's abbreviated uh, or reduced in size in relation to the figures so as to get it in, in the same way that you would have it on, uh, on a stage representation of this. Like if, if they had a play and they had these things, this is what the kind of thing they'd have, you know, a, a set. And he's made them look um, realistic or naturalistic. Here's another one up here of the shadowing under here. It makes it look like, you know, these things project out, and this is a, a recession, and there's enough space in here for all these people to be. Let's look at um, the Lamentation just up close. This is one of the works on your list. Um, another thing is expression. That is, it's not just a... Uh, uh, telling a story, it's wanting you to feel the story, and uh, the gestures of the of the people, the expressions on their faces, and the agitation that you see in all the angels up in the sky, all give you an impression of of uh, of, of the lamentation, so that that you too would feel what's going on. Here again, looking up closer, you see the boulder like people here he wants you to see them as real things in space and he wants you as they wait they have weight and mass and contrast this to the middle ages where figures are are paper dolls these are not like paper dolls they have they stand on the ground they seem to to, to have weight in a presence and because their faces have expression they they're like they're people like us they are people you can identify with If you saw the video uh, that I, I put the link to for uh, how panel paintings are made, one of the things that they mentioned was that lapis lazuli, which is a precious stone found in Afghanistan, was uh, uh, something used as to, to make blue. 
and it was a very precious blue. It was more expensive than gold. And uh, the Arena Chapel has a lot of it. This, this, the sky is all blue. And if we look back at the, the thing, the, 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 the ceiling up here is all blue. And it's very, very expensive. And that was one of the ways that the patron was using uh, his money as a way to, uh, to show how much he's spending. And uh, uh, by, 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 using, by using some gold and using some blue, he's, he's showing off his wealth. I mean, the, the building itself, of course, is, is, is a, a demonstration of his wealth. And the fact that it's painted by Giotto, the best painter in the world at the time, uh, is also a thing. But you, it does the same thing. But um, the blues are, are you know, a, a, a very striking feature of that uh, spending of money. An unfortunate thing about the lapis lazuli, though, is that it's not painted on the wet plaster. Painting paint that is put onto the wet plaster soaks into the plaster and is and become bonded with it, and it lasts forever. It's, it looks just as fresh, you know. Once you if you can clean it, it it, it looks it looks as fresh as when it was first painted. But the lapis, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. It, it has to be painted when it's dry. And it's called a uh, uh, secco, I mean, on a dry surface. And, and as a result, it, it flakes off it done over time. So I guess I'm sure that when it was first made, it was blues were very striking and blue all over the place. You can see um, some areas, though, where blues have flaked off. So you have to pretend that this sort of level of blue up here is in the sky and all these other places there originally was. So imagine all that blue strong blue in the sky right here and and that this would be a very striking image the the gold halos uh, i think they, they they put an extra layer of of gesso which is the uh the kind of a plaster stuff that you they they, they put as the surface of the picture on halos in order to raise them a little bit so that they have some dimension to them and they were gilt and gold leaf was applied to them uh to add extra you know sparkle and shine uh and demonstration of wealth The other work that's on your list is, is this one. It's called The Kiss of Judas. And it, uh, it shows some re remarkable features. It's, it's a night scene, so it's, much, it's a darker blue. And, it's, uh, and you can see some torches and things. So it's, it, it occurs at night. But you can, you can see how he's organized the picture in such a way as to uh, amplify the action. Uh, things are... Uh, figures are still rendered as very massive. There's just a few of them in the front and the crowds in the back are represented as, as just a bunch of heads. Uh, these, this black down in the background, these are the soldiers' helmets and they would have been silver and silver tarnishes and that's why that's black like that. So you can imagine those being really shiny. Um, you see Christ in the middle with Judas and Judas had told the, uh, uh, the leaders of the of the of, of the Jewish religious leaders, that told them that you know he he would betray Jesus. He would you know for thirty pieces of sil silver, and he would tell them which one Jesus is when he came to arrest him by it's the one that I kiss. So you know he comes up to him and he kisses him, and, and Jesus says you you betray me with a kiss. I mean, it's pointing out the irony of that. But this is a, a a confrontation between good and evil, and Giotto has boiled the story down to just this one image right here in the center close up a little bit of it and uh, he's pointed at it with all these uh, uh, pikes and lanterns I guess and this club all point at this area right here for the purpose of you know making you understand that this is the this is the area of action and this is not a uh, Another feature, this is a formal feature, is using the forms of the picture to amplify the story and to help tell the story and to, you know, energize the story. It's, they're, they're not there. I mean, they could, they could just as easily be standing straight up and, and just be depictions of, uh, of soldiers' pikes. But instead, he's using them in a formal way to do something to the picture. He also does that with 
this gesture here, this arm reaching out, pointing towards, towards Christ, and this arm here is also pointing towards Christ, and this line here is pointing towards Christ. Everything seems to sweep, and everything is pointing to this one central part, and that's a, that's a formal thing. That has to do with using the forms of the picture rather than uh, a, 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 a representational thing. The figure here in the, uh, on the left is, just, is a figure grabbing the cloak of Peter, who is in the process of cutting the ear off of one of the soldiers. Uh, and you know that you know, a moment later, Christ picks up the ear and heals it. Um, and uh, in other depictions of this, he's, he does do that. Uh, but in this scene, he's, he wants to focus your attention on this. He gives you an extra detail of part of the story. This is a necessary part of the story that any depiction of the kiss of Judas is going to have. But it's a minor thing that you could easily miss, and he's using the, the line of it uh, in a way to help tell the primary story, which is the kiss. I point out these features uh, because uh, we're going to look at another depiction of the kiss of Judas when we get to Duccio, and he does things differently. So remember this one. It, it, it has very massive figures. Has, he sees figures as real figures in space with mass, and they stand on the ground, and they, um, they have a presence, and they, you can identify with them. The faces, the expressions, they're all, you know, like us. And they all are like, like people on a stage. I can show you a, a few more imagery just so you can uh, get a sense of what the whole thing sort of looks like. Uh, again, the stage-like quality. This is uh, a crucifixion with the, the cross on this, you know, just a, a, a small indication of where uh, Golgotha is. And a little skull there to tell you that that's what it is in case you, you didn't know already. Mary Magdalene here and Mary... Uh, uh, the mother of Christ is is swooning and being held up uh, by two people. Um, these are the soldiers who were dividing the cloak uh, in order because they uh, it had no seam. They had to uh, draw lots for it or something. Um, and the and the angels up in the sky uh, lamenting and creating this agitation, a nativity. And you can see how the the blue has flaked off. Uh, but the, um, but you can tell, you know, the boulder-like quality of, of Joseph here in the front, the realistic depiction of, of animals in, in space, uh, these other figures, you know, they're standing on the ground, angels up in the sky, um, the architecture looks like, you know, a three-dimensional space in which the action can happen. And this uh, last one is the uh, the Christ's entry in Jerusalem, and uh, we'll see another version of this by Duccio, so you can remember this one. Uh, one innovation here is to have, um, um, in you know, when Christ entered Jerusalem, the the people would you know take off their cloaks and put them on the ground so that you could walk on them because it was like royalty coming. And here's a, a figure who's beginning to take off you know the sleeve of one garment, and there's another one who's pulling it over their head, and then the one on the ground who's uh, putting it on the ground. So there's almost a kind of a three-step cinemagraphic uh, uh, representation of, of an event. So you can see three things happening in time that go in sequence. Remember how he demonstrated, how, how he rendered a crowd of people. You saw, you see a couple up in the front and the one in there in front of the ones in the back and you see all their little halos and tops of heads over there. So that represents a crowd of people rather than showing each individually or even stacking them up in the, in the behind up here so that, uh, uh, so that you see those faces in the Middle Ages. And Duccio, as we'll see later, will stack them up for the, same, for the purpose of showing them. He wants to show you everything, uh, but Jatu is committed to a, a single point of view or being very close to a single point of view. Uh, he is not yet... You know, it's a hundred years before perspective is invented, where there's a uh, a system for doing that. He's just just by eye is making things seen, seen, being seen uh, from the same point of view. Again, look at the uh, formal element of this 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 line here. 
of the donkey continuing over here into this line here, sort of making this movement go up into this um, model of, of Jerusalem that he's going into. This makes a nice little little sweep, and here you can also make it sweep sweep back. Uh, so it makes a kind of a turbulence going on here. Um, uh, nice composition. I mean, and the fact that he's thinking in terms of a composition, that he's arranging things on on a surface for the purpose of of uh, amplifying the story. You know, I just noticed this 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 arch right here is reflected in this one here, so it's to create a circle. Uh, I don't know what that's for, but it's it's nice that it looks like it looks like an intentional circle there. Okay, so that's that's Giotto and uh, and the Arena Chapel, and you have one other Giotto, the uh, uh, Ogni Santi Madonna, which is the Madonna and Child uh, with Saint. And together, you know, he's uh, this this represents the the you know the big hero of 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 the Renaissance. The Italians now think think of him, you know, like you know, like we think of George Washington, you know, he's he's the one who started it all.